Okay. How can we know the suttas are true events? And how can we interpret things like the ability to pass through walls, etc.? If Harry Potter could do that, <laughs> why can't Buddhists? <laughs> <laughs> and the authority of the suttas, anyone who wishes to check that out, you can go online and uh, have a look at the, what's it called again? Authenticity, Authenticity Project. I think it's uh, Ajahn Bamali and Ajahn Sujato and a few others did a book online to try and gather all the evidence together on why these suttas are accurate. One of the reasons is that each one of these suttas are repeated so many times, just like my stories and jokes. <laughs> and because of that, it means that they support the authenticity of each other. So it's actually quite incredible. People try to find out mistakes in them, but they're pretty, pretty um, uh, supporting. So I have no doubt they're authentic. The best way to prove they're authentic is to try them and see if uh, eventually you can pass through walls. <laughs> <laughs> you might get a few uh, bumps on your head first of all, but eventually it works. I pass through a, hall, uh, through a, a wall every day. It's called going through the door. <laughs> oh, come on. I think, do another one, because that was quite quick. This is quick too. Okay. Is it easy to be a monk in your monastery? Absolutely. Once you, <laughs> once you are a monk, it's easy to stay as a monk. It's hard to get in, but once you're in, it's easy to stay. <laughs> That's what being a monk is like, being full of ease. You know, and easy. Sometimes it's quite sort of what's ascetic, but it's simple. If you like that sort of lifestyle, it is full of ease. You can sit down and bliss out. You can just sleep not that much and still be rested. And you can be very healthy. And it's a lovely lifestyle. It's very full of ease. Go on. This is really good. Are there instances when I should not be kind? This is so cool. <laughs> because when you really read the suttas and you understand what the Buddha's getting at, even when it says things like, in this case, with a person, you should ignore them. That is actually an instruction in some cases. It's an aspect of being kind. At first you think, huh, I should ignore someone? Someone wrote me a message, they said, if that's really true, there's a lot of people I'm going to be ignoring. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, when you look closer at it, saying no to someone is often saying yes to ourselves. It's just giving ourselves a break for a while. So the Buddha talked about five ways of overcoming resentment. The first was loving kindness. So this is obviously straight out kindness with body, speech and mind. And the Buddha said we should have thoughts of loving kindness, not only in public, so when you're talking to someone, but also in private. So we can also have kind thoughts to someone when they're far away. And then if that doesn't work, we can have compassion. If that doesn't work, what's the next one? Is it equanimity next? No, you're, you're answering the question. Oh. <laughs> you just told me to be kind by saying no. <laughs> I'm not asking you. <laughs> anyway, huh? No, it's not actually. Anyway, equanimity is there. I, I know what it is. It's equanimity and then it's actually ignoring a person, which, uh, which is what I'm talking about. And then the last one is when you've tried all that, um, just applying the law of karma to the situation, understanding that people are the way they are because of conditions. We are the way we are, whether we're able to be kind or not because of conditions. So it's a really beautiful teaching, but they're all aspects of kindness in one way or another. So the only time not to be kind, I guess, is uh, if you're, you're not able to right now, and then you're kind to yourself and you forgive yourself for that. But the aim is always to... Um, you know, do whatever's needed in the moment in order to later on be kind. And sometimes loving kindness means uh, having distance from a person if, you know, that relationship or that person is really, um, really harmful for you. Yeah? Okay? Is that all right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you ignoring me, Adrian? <laughs> That's one of the ways of being kind, isn't it? <laughs> Okay, dear Ajahn and Venerable Chanda, 
I see so much suffering in the world. The more I practice compassion, the more I am overwhelmed by the suffering I I take over. I uh, over the, the suffering. I take over this madness like it is my own and feel depressed a lot of the time. How can I protect myself? Two ways, first of all, is remember that uh, whenever you have uh, talking about suffering in the world, remember you're involved in this. It's never about them, it's always about us. You're part of this. So you don't take it on so much that you suffer as well. It gets worse. How Ajahn Chah taught me is when you talking to people receiving questions like this, I become a rubbish bin, a trash can, a dustbin. So you can put all of your questions in here. People ask me about marriage. I never got married. I escaped that suffering and now you bang it on me again. <laughs> so, <laughs> and about kids, I didn't have any kids. So anyway. I do, uh, actually. No, I, I've, I've <laughs> abandoned you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> no, but what he said is that be kind, compassionate, receive everything. So if people want to talk to you, please talk and, and pay attention and receive it all. But always be a dustbin with a hole in the bottom. So it means your dustbin never gets full. It's always empty for the next person who comes to see you. <laughs> and number two, it's, uh, it never gets uh, full, it never gets a burden. So as soon as you walk out of the interview or the counselling session, you don't take the problem with you. Otherwise that's not being compassionate towards yourself or compassionate towards others. The ability to let things go. To be a dustbin with a hole in the bottom. Can I just add one little thing to that? No. I knew you'd say that. I was waiting for the, for the entertainment value. Okay, go um, on. <laughs> sometimes people feel that when they're attuned to um, suffering, that's being compassionate. And there will be an element of compassion in that. But genuine compassion is actually one of the Brahma Viharas. It's an immeasurable state, which is blissful. And the bit that's missing there in the compassion, you might be resonating with the suffering and getting empathy coming up, and that's beautiful. It's a basis for compassion. But real compassion is actually not tuning into the suffering, but wishing the person freedom from suffering. So true compassion is actually looking at the possibility of that person's happiness and peace. So this is how it becomes uh, actually a very nourishing quality. Yeah. But if, if you're, you know, doing a lot of compassion and still you're getting depressed or whatever, try to do some mudita instead because mudita is the opposite of that. You're tuning up with the goodness and the happiness in the world. So we have to balance these things. Yeah. These all say Ajahn, but sorry, you're getting me as well. Actually, I'm an Ajahn now. I just don't use those words. Ajahn. <laughs> Please could you advise how to work with monkey mind while meditating? My mind likes to wander a lot when I sit in the morning with gratitude and metta. People don't know what a monkey mind is. A monkey mind is not <laughs> a restless mind. Yeah. It's a quick repetition of this story. Uh, in Colombo at Waysack Day, a monkey went to a big ceremony because all his food dropped. And so the monkey was there waiting for someone to drop a mango or a banana. That would be his lunch. But then he heard this priest, this monk, giving a sermon. And the sermon was about the monkey mind and how difficult that is you know, when you're trying to meditate. And the monkey was really offended. <laughs> you guys who talk about monkey mind, you haven't got a clue what a monkey mind is. You're a human being. I'm going to go and complain to the World Wildlife Fund. I'm going to go get a lawyer from the uh, Greenpeace and sue you guys. So he's very upset and angry. He swung back to the forest clearing where the other monkeys lived and he complained. He said, you should hear what these Buddhist monks are saying about us. A monkey mind, a monkey mind is bad. We've all got monkey minds. It's not bad. You can't discriminate and judge us like this. We've got to complain. And they all started jumping up and down. And then as they were jumping up and down, the head monkey said, stop. 
that is a monkey mind, jumping up and down, just getting crazy. The monk was right, you have got a monkey mind. <laughs> Obviously. So the monk is, oh, yeah, we've got monkey minds. <laughs> How do we get rid of them? And he said, well, I also heard from that monk that if you meditate, you can overcome the monkey mind. Let's meditate, let's meditate, they all said. <laughs> he said, be quiet. How do we meditate? Well, first of all, you've got to have a nice posture. So get a nice cushion. They didn't have cushions like you have them here. They had to go to the jungle, get some grass, make it into a nice zafu, nice and big, and sit there. And what do we do now? You sit there on your bottom, and then you put your right leg over your left leg, the right paw over your left paw, back straight, uh, put your uh, chin in, and start watching your breath. And that was the first time in the history of the world <laughs> that, mon that monkeys meditated. <laughs> Only for about a minute. Then one of the monkeys put their hand up and said, excuse me, excuse me, don't you remember we were supposed to go to the, the banana plantation to raid the, the plantation with all the people at the temple? That would be our lunch today. Yeah, I was thinking of that as well. Let's go and raid the plantation now get it out of the way so we don't have to think about it anymore. Good idea. So they all got off their seats, swung to the banana plantation. They stole as many bananas as you think. They didn't eat them yet. It wasn't lunchtime. Just to get that out of the way so they didn't need to think about it and plan it. And they all returned to their little cushions, uh, sat down, right leg over the left leg, right paw over the left paw, <laughs> thumb slightly touching, chin tucked in, back straight, started watching their breath again, breathing in, breathing out. Excuse me, said another <laughs> monkey. I've been thinking. So I've been thinking that before we eat those bananas, we'll have to peel them first. <laughs> Let's all peel them. Won't eat them yet, just peel them. So get that out of the way, so I don't need to think about it. So they all got off the cushions, peeled all the bananas, didn't eat any. And then they sat on the, the cushions and started meditating again. Breathing in, breathing out. Excuse me. <laughs> said another monkey, you know it's true, before you eat those bananas, oh, they're already peeled, they're already there, before you eat them you have to put them in your mouth first. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just put them in their mouth, we won't eat them yet. <laughs> so they all got up and got a banana each, some monkeys got two, some got three, you know what monkeys are like. <laughs> just like us human beings. And then with a couple of bananas in their mouth, they sat down in the seats, right leg over the left leg, right paw over the left paw, back straight, closed their eyes, and as soon as they closed their eyes, they ate all those bananas. <laughs> That's a monkey mind. Let's get this out of the way first, and then we'll be quiet. And I like that story. Mm. It's not just restlessness. I do. You don't have to do it now. You do it later, but why do we have to do it now? That's called monkey mind. Good. I'll do a different one. Oh. Yeah. But really, the moral is be kind to it. Because they were being told the monkey mind was bad. So don't tell your mind it's bad. You're condemning it. Is it bad? It's just natural. I mean, one of the things some, you notice some, when you meditate is... Some agents. Yeah. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> It's old karma, basically. Yeah. It's just old karma. It's just what the mind does, you know, because you put all that stuff in, so it's <laughs> going to start coming out as soon as you meditate. But the more you let it come out and the less you put in, eventually it calms down. So there's really nothing to worry about. Just understand it as, you know, the, the karmic result of everything you've been doing. And that's actually one of the ways that it was easy for me to stop kind of watching movies and even listening to Led Zeppelin and all the music that I love, because as soon as I meditated, it all came back. And I realized I was putting this massive obstacle between me and peace. So, yeah, be careful what you put in there next time. Uh, okay, that's similar. I'm going to see there's a slightly different one. Is the hindrance of aversion the same as resistance and how to deal with it? Shall I go for it or do you want to do it? Oh, you, do it first. you do it first and I'll do it afterwards. <laughs> Are you resisting do. doing it? Absolutely. <laughs> Okay. So resistance, I think, is a subtle kind of aversion. 
I mean, aversion is basically, in meditation, that kind of movement of the mind that is repelled from the meditation object. It's any kind of movement that doesn't want. So you don't like something, you pull away from it rather. Whereas the greed is like you're drawn into it. You're kind of grasping after something. So yeah, I think often it does manifest as resistance. And I've noticed this in myself when I'm meditating sometimes and some kind of experience is quite unpleasant. And part of my mind feels like, oh, I'm just being with it. You know, let's just be with it and relax with it. And you try to have the right attitude, but then sometimes you can just notice this subtle kind of tension which is just keeping slightly away from it. There's this resistance there. There's a kind of hardness of the mind. And at that time, if you can just notice that you're resisting the experience and soften the mind a little bit and just like relax and allow it to be, give it compassion. Notice, you know, that there's this space between the mind and the object. And instead of resistance, which keeps you away, you just put loving kindness and compassion and this brings the whole experience into your mind so you can melt into it rather than stay away. So yeah, it is a kind of resistance and it keeps you one step from reality in that way. I don't know, what do you think? Yes, good. Also right. add though, it includes fear. Mm. And when you get into the deeper meditation, that's such a common obstacle that you're fearing of the unknown you're fearing of letting go of something. You resist meditating, or you resist um, doing without food in the evening, or resist not speaking. And after a while, when you practice uh, silence, it's more, much more beautiful. And you know, renouncing is much more beautiful. And not having any questions is much more beautiful. <laughs> but later on, you get these beautiful lights in the mind, the deep meditations. And it's amazing how many people resist those. They think, number one, they're not ready for it, or they don't deserve it, and they have a fear of it because it's very powerful, and much of what you think you own or are disappears. Your sense of self disappears. Your sense of control disappears. It's so much more be beautiful. Don't resist that fear or resist those states of mind which you're afraid of. I am a daydream, a daydreamer. And my mind wanders with the time. I can even have conversations with people in my head. So, it is very difficult for me to meditate. Guided meditation is okay because there is a focus. When it's complete silence, what should I focus on? On the silence. If that's what's there, you know, please focus on the silence, focus on the peace. After a while, silence is absolutely beautiful. So many times in my life, look, even once, uh, when I was uh, staying at Chithurst Monastery down in Sussex, and it was the m middle of the winter, because I was a visitor, I had no duties, and so I decided to go out in the early morning it was a very heavy snow the night before, minus 26 degrees. And the, so all the roads were blocked. There was no aircraft in the sky. No birds were flying. No, no people were up. So only mad monks were out at that time of the morning in the cold snow. But I always remember it being so incredibly silent. There was no, no, no sound at all. All the animals were hibernating. Same with the people, they were in their warm houses. And it was a great privilege to be out there in the cold snow fields in Sussex, because I was alone. When I stopped treading in the snow, it's like the whole world stopped. Silence is one of the most beautiful experiences you can ever have. So, get to know silence. Be a friend of silence. You often find that, that becomes so energizing, therapeutic. Don't try and work things out with your mind. Just let silence teach you. It just kind of soaks away all of those problems. Okay, that's enough. <coughs> 
Ooh, in one of your deeper Dhamma talks, you mentioned cultivating energy with one's wisdom power. Can you please explain this further? Okay, you want to do it? Oh, no, because it's it. your talk. Okay. No, it's just uh, an example which comes to mind that when I once gave a, a kind of retreat day uh, just, uh, just outside the demilitarized zone between North Korea and South Korea. And part of that, I, we were asked, you know, to, I was asked, there was about three leading monks there, and they, Ajahn Gunha was there, and they asked Ajahn Gunha, can you please lead us in doing some walking meditation in the DMZ? But you know, he had a doctor, he wasn't as fit and healthy as I am, because <laughs> he doesn't drink tea with condensed milk. <laughs> I don't know why, but anyway, so he couldn't do it. And the other uh, Korean monk, he was already off on another appointment. So I got to lead the group in the DMZ, inside the DMZ. There's about 600 of us. We were shot many times. I'm a monk, I don't lie. I was shot many times with cameras and videos. That's called shooting, isn't it? <laughs> okay. But then, you know, as you know, I don't get much exercise in my life, do I? This gets lots of exercise, the mouse. <laughs> but, you know, it was, it was about a four hour walk. So anyway, I was walking and I was getting tired. You know, really tired, exhausted. So you know what I did? It's something which you kind of learn as a monk. You'd be rebellious. Because I was tired, I decided to walk <coughs> faster, not slower. And when you walk faster, it's like you get another boost of energy. You have energy inside of you, but you just don't use it. So the meditation taught me you know, how when you use energy, when you sort of um, start to walk faster, it's amazing, you can complete the journey so much more easy with more fun. I heard there was a couple of young monks behind me, they said, oh yeah, this Ajahn Brahm is very good at samadhi. This is like samadhi power. It was just wisdom power. All right? Yeah, I'm okay. Cool. Okay, that's the same question actually, so we'll carry on. Aha, that's another the same question. Right, I'm going to do this one. <coughs> okay, no matter what it is. Interesting. Uh, do you think it's possible for a monk or a nun practicing at the time of the Buddha to still be around today and to be living a lay life? If it is, how can it be explained? How long can it take, even with good conditions? So if you've read some of the Vinaya stories in the uh, Pali Canon, you will know that in the time of the Buddha, there were these groups of six naughty monks. And wasn't there a group of six nuns as well who got up to all kinds of trouble? Yes. Um, even months. though the Buddha was around. Yeah. Sorry? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> One of the, who was it? That nun, that nun in the um, Vinaya who, um, actually was a bit lazy one morning, and in those days they didn't have proper flushing toilets. Oh, that. So she collected yes, it's a good story. all the excrement from the nuns' quarters into a bucket. They had to do that every morning, that was her job. They didn't have any um, sewage system. That's what I said. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to carry on? Of course not, it's a nun story. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then she thought, okay, what can I do just to get rid of this really quickly? And she decided to climb up and throw it over the monastery wall. <laughs> and they had these really big walls to keep them in, you know, because uh, they don't want to leave, of course. And uh, she threw it over the wall just when this very rich, refined gentleman was walking past in his best clothes on the way to see the king. And guess where it landed? <laughs> all over his head and down his clothes. So he was very upset and, and distraught and said, these nuns, these are terrible. I'm going to complain and I'm going to get them like, I don't know, 
tell the king and maybe get them even executed, who knows? But uh, then somebody in the street or something like this heard him and they said, no, you're so lucky. They, they used to, These nuns are really holy. They use the torches on the side of the road, which light the way. Oh, yeah. So he got one of those torches and he went inside the nuns monastery to burn the oh, whole monastery oh. down, the whole lot. Yeah. But then somebody told him that actually it was a very big blessing that he had poo on his head from the holy nuns. It's like holy water. Yeah. <laughs> but it's holy. Right. Shit, yes. <laughs> it's the best you can possibly get from these amazing nuns. You gave holy water to a snake once. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, it was early in the morning. It was dark. I went out to urinate and I thought I was peeing on a stick. And the stick started to move. That's, for ladies, you don't understand just how sensitive that part of your body is. And it was right in biting distance. Mm. It never bit me at all. It felt, wow, how lucky I am <laughs> being blessed from the holy water directly from a monk. So these are the things that monks do even today, <laughs> which is probably why they're still around. The, the snake loved it. <laughs> but did you ask the snake? I could see it never bit me. It must oh, have. Really? Yes. Okay, probably ran fast. Anyway, so oh, this is fast. the kind of thing that the nuns got up to. And it turned out really nicely because uh, he believed this person that told him it was good luck and got dressed again and went to see the king and got a very good deal after all. And anyway, it just shows that monks and nuns in the time of the Buddha were the same as us. Right, so even if you're around the Buddha, even if you have perfect conditions, it really depends how ready the mind is and how much you've developed your qualities, right? So it's quite possible, I think, for some of those naughty monks and nuns to be around now and to be living a lay life. Who do you think they are? I don't know. They'd probably be on retreats like this, right? Hmm. <laughs> so this isn't a problem. I mean, the idea of how long it can take as you know, sometimes really troubling because it makes us carry this burden of time and feel like, oh, I'm stuck in some sorrow, it's going to take so long. And actually what we need to be developing is patience, right? And putting down this idea of time. And in a sense, if you can develop that patience, no matter how long it takes, you can just be doing good. And in that sense, I mean, the longer the better, right? <laughs> That's one way to look at it. And if you have that kind of attitude, it will actually shorten your path. So don't worry too much about how long it takes. Just worry about how much kindness you put into it and how much you're developing those beautiful qualities to serve yourself and others. That's the most important thing. So yeah, we do look for good conditions, of course. We try and cultivate those good conditions by donating to Anukampa so that we can have more fertile conditions. And we're not going, we do have toilets. Kind of so <laughs> it's not going to backfire. Um, but yeah, it's important to put the good conditions in place and the good conditions of the mind as well. So try to develop patience and trust. The end of that story was that the, the lay person, the, the, the guy who had the ship put on his head, that uh, once he got the very lucrative contract from the king, he went around telling all his friends. Saying, <laughs> if you really want good luck and good contracts, go to the Nazi monastery and ask for the real holy water. <laughs> and when that got around to the Buddha, the Buddha called the nuns over and said, look, you're really lucky that time. <laughs> Don't try that again. And he made it an offence, a rule of Vinaya. Any nun who throws a bucket of poo over the wall commits a pachitiya offence. It's Pachitya number eight. If you get a book on Pachitya number eight, you can look at it up and read it. It's but all that true. means is you have to tell someone you've done it, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, see, that was an interesting question. See if I can get a nice one like that too. Here we go. Beware. <laughs> Actually, we have a wall at the back of the monastery. Yeah, there A nice we go. high wall and people come behind it all the time. So anyone who wants to visit and clean the place up? Yeah, <laughs> yeah but you can come. <laughs> yeah, they, they need to be blessed. I have my visitors too. <laughs> now, honestly, the, 
one of the things Ajahn Chah did, I really think that these monks push it too far sometimes, but he did get oh, away no. with it. <laughs> Ajahn, we've only got 10 minutes. Okay, but this is worth it. Oh, no. <laughs> It was a major general in the uh, Thai oh, army good. came to see, see Ajahn Chah. <laughs> now, the like, major generals in the Thai army, they've got a lot of political power. <laughs> Basically, they can do whatever they want. So he came to see Ajahn Chah with all his other lieutenants and colonels and stuff. And then he went in there and he said, I really need some holy water. And usually Ajahn Chah doesn't keep any holy water. So he said, I haven't got any. He said, but I want some. OK, come over here. And so the, the Major General, with all the power, just bent down and Ajahn Chah went <laughs> <laughs> and rubbed it in with his hand. And when I saw that, I thought, oh my goodness, this is the end of Ajahn Chah. <laughs> but he got away with it. Does anyone want some holy water from me? <laughs> <laughs> okay, my question. What was the moment you thought, I'm going to stay a monastic for life, and why? For either uh, Venerable Chand or LP. And they call me an LP because that means a record. And <laughs> I keep repeating myself again and again. <laughs> so this is not a joke, this is true. That when I ordained as a novice monk, which was over 49 years ago now, then I remember those first few nights in Bangkok, waking up in the middle of the night with a nightmare. I was 23 at the time, still a young man. My nightmare was I was a lay person. And when I opened my eyes, I saw my robes neatly folded next to the bed on the floor, the mattress. And I thought, this is no exaggeration. I'm a monk. I've made it. I'm in brown. I closed my eyes and fell asleep just so peacefully. Now, three nights in a row. And because of that, I realized there was something much more than I could see by logic or reason. I love that, that life, being a monk. So all those years, I've never, ever thought of leaving this, this beautiful lifestyle. Okay, I yeah. want to answer that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So for me, it's, uh, for women generally, it's often quite a long path to get into robes because there just aren't the same opportunities. So whereas Ajahn Brahm could go to Thailand and be ordained immediately and after six weeks be fully ordained, for me it was 10 years until I could be ordained and another eight years until I could be fully ordained. And this was with exactly the same uh, aspiration and strength of commitment to the path. So by the time I finally found a place to ordain in Myanmar with my teacher Sayadaw Upanya Jota, who was my preceptor there, um, I remember going there and it was just a three, I think that must have been the second time because uh, I went there for three months during my degree. It was my only chance. I started this degree simply as a filler because I couldn't find somewhere to ordain. And uh, afterwards I went there to ordain again. And he said, if you ordain, is it for life? And without any hesitation, I just said yes. And he said, if it's for life, I'll build you a kuti. And uh, a kuti is like a hut where you can meditate in solitude. And yeah, within a year, he built this beautiful kuti opposite a pagoda that he's also built with a meditation hall inside. And um, yeah, it was just such a strong calling for me, even from the first retreat I did at 20. So by the time I finally got to ordain, it was... Yeah, just very obvious it would be for life. And the interesting thing is, even before I ordained, one of the things that kept my commitment going, it was such a strong kind of calling. I just said to myself, like, I can give this one life for renouncing. You know, it's just one life. I had this idea that there were many, and I just thought, just give this life for that, you know, no matter what happens. And thanks to my good karma or good fortune, whatever it may be, I've always had exceptionally brilliant teachers who've somehow taken me under their wing, <laughs> like it or not. <laughs> and uh, this has given the path enormous power. And I think it must be similar for you, Ajahn. I mean, when you are oh, with, yeah. you know, the enlightened teachers and you know this is something very special, it kind of sustains you. And I think that's one of the reasons it's possible to stay in robes for life.
The only reason that I would envisage having to leave the robes is if I simply can't survive. And even then, can you imagine anything better? I can't imagine anything better than dying in the robes. So, yeah. Excellent. Okay. You There's only <coughs> five left. Five minutes. One minute for each one. Mm. Crikey. Dear Vedal Chandra and Ajahn Brahm, in the psychological field, the purpose of mindfulness is to cultivate an awareness and acceptance of all internal experiences, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. The point is not to change the expectations, but to fully accept it as it is. In Ajahn Brahm's teachings, I get the impression that the purpose of meditation and mindfulness of meditation is to create a state of relaxation and joy that the meditation experience is moment to moment is meant to be pleasant. I find there is two perspectives diverging and confusing. Any thoughts on this? Certainly, you start off you know, with uh, acceptance. If you accept it properly, it disappears. If you accept it with kindness, you undermine sort of those memories of the past or experiences in the present. I've had wonderful discussions, you know, with uh, top psychologists and therapists and psychiatrists who always thought at first you can't let go of the past without dealing with it. Yes, you can. You have so many uh, like rocks in your backpack which you don't need. You don't need to take them out and examine them and say, what should I do with this? If you want the fast way, actually it's the only way because you've got too many uh, traumas from the past, throw them out straight away. Let them go. When you realize non-self, it means you don't own anything which means that you can throw them out and you're free of them. When you don't have any fear of the future, then you can not have any anxieties about what the future is going to hold for you. This is like the Buddhist way. You don't have to deal with or be punished or endure the problems of the past or the worries about the future. This is one of the reasons why, even in the time of the Buddha, People would go to the Jetavana monastery and just comment about how the Sangha there were always smiling and happy. It's one of the reasons why I refused to go and ordain with miserable monks. There were many miserable monks around, <coughs> and miserable Sayadors and miserable nuns as well. <laughs> There's not many nuns. How can there be many miserable nuns? Not fully ordained bhikkhunis. Ah. <laughs> but actually, when you went to to see someone like an Ajahn Chah and Ajahn Tate, not all those monks were were happy. When you saw a happy one, oh, you never wanted to leave them. It was wisdom. And you've known me for a long time. Am I a happy monk? Oh yes. Am I miserable? Only when you don't get enough Connie's milk. That's true, I admit that. <laughs> no. So anyway, this holy life is meant to be happy. That's this great attraction. You get happier and happier and happier and oh, happier. <laughs> you don't have to be miserable. Anyway, your turn. This is for you. That's radical. Yeah. Yeah. Is it okay to talk about your spiritual experiences to motivate someone or should we only talk about it to our teachers? Yeah, I would say it's good to talk about your practice maybe, to share the inspiration that you have, maybe to share the results of your practice through your kindness and through being an example to your friends and parents. Um, but be careful about talking about spiritual experiences as if they're kind of trophies. Also because you might be mistaking what it is you've really experienced. You know, sometimes people take, say, a light in the mind to be enlightenment. After all, you know, in the Dhammachaka Sutta, it says that light arose with the Buddha's enlightenment. 
And there's all kinds of overestimation and misinterpretation of these things. So sometimes that's not so inspiring to other people. You know, you can come across as a little bit arrogant or maybe it even puts people off because they think, well, I'll never have that experience. So rather than talk about your actual experiences, I would really suggest just living a Dhamma life, serving, being generous, being kind, and that's more likely to attract people to the path. Because after all, this path is about losing the sense of self, right? And one of the signs that that's happening is a sense of humility arising. You know, so many teachers talk about all these experiences, but if you read the suttas and you listen to them carefully, you realize actually what they're experiencing, something's missing there. Especially if you see somebody's sila has uh, gaps, you know, their virtue is not uh, what it should be, then who cares what you experience when you close your eyes if, you, if you're actually not becoming more kind? I don't care. So I'm not impressed by that. I'm ex impressed by people really living the Dhamma and embodying the qualities of the Dhamma. So I would recommend that. But yes, yeah, certainly talk about meditation retreats that people can do if they ask. But don't be one of these like really tyrannical kind of people who goes out like a proselytizer or missionary because that's not what the Buddha recommended. That's not the business we're in. What do you think? <laughs> well, I say that it doesn't matter what your experiences are during this retreat, I am not going to give you certificates. Yeah. <laughs> and it's great to talk to your teachers if there's a teacher you trust. It's actually really important to check in um, so that they can help you assess exactly what's happening in the context of the path. All right. Uh, this one for you. Actually, it's quite hard to read. I can read it here. Could you please tell us about visual... Crucial. No, visual. Ah. Visual experiences during meditation, okay. e.g. lights, and these are nimitters. I'm going to talk about that probably tomorrow. Hmm. I'll leave that here. Ah, since a stressful period and getting and quitting an addiction, I find I have energy and movement in my forehead, and this is so much more intense during meditation. What would you advise? Just make peace with it, in short. Don't try to analyze, is it due to the addiction? Is it due to this? Is it due to that? Just see if you can give it kindness and care. That's it. It will pass. It will pass. And you don't have to be with it all the time. You know, sometimes our mind has this negativity bias and we just hone in on whatever's the strongest, whatever's the most uncomfortable. You might also sometimes want to um, be aware of something else. You're not pushing it away, but you're just keeping it on the background of your awareness. So, yeah, don't worry about it. Don't analyze it too much. Just be present and be kind. Okay? Yeah. Right. The last one, but unfortunately we haven't got time. It's <laughs> there is actually one more. We've done that. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that quick. Dear Venerable Bulls, the biggest distraction to my meditation is music playing in my head. <laughs> Sometimes it's music I haven't heard of in years. I try to be, uh, I try to be something observer to it but a kind observer to it and listen to less music, but it always uh, cups, back. Cu cu cups back in, I don't know. Comes back in. Comes, yeah, doesn't look like an M there. Do you have any advice for this? Many thanks and much meta. One of the reasons why all these distractions come in, they're not important. And I remember that sometimes when I used to be a school teacher the first year, you come home from teaching in a school, and I'd turn the TV on, looked at anything. I didn't mind. I was just trying to escape from the tiredness of you know, working during the day. And I realized that people, meditation, do that. You have these, these uh, things which you just um, surf your old memories, surf just all the music you used to hear, just something to do so you're not paying attention to what is more important. So these things come in. If they come in, just let them come in. Open the door of your heart to music or distractions or anything which comes in. But make sure you keep the door open so the door is there to come in and to go out as well. 
if you don't pay it too much attention, especially don't get negative towards it, you don't try and get it out, it just disappears by itself. It's useless stuff. So just give it the time, it wants to come in, it comes in and it goes out. You don't have to worry too much about that. When you get something else which is more important than those old memories, an old filing cabinet of dreams and plans and, and uh, excitement, when you get rid of all of those, then sort of uh, it just disappears. All right. I'm really going to do this one very quickly because it's similar. Okay. Um, and I'll just say a couple of words. Should I use any force or just be kind? <laughs> so you know the answer, right? For example, if I shouldn't listen to music, but it would be kind for myself to do so. So try not to use any shoulds because should is something different from actually what's happening and the way your mind's working. Um, the way it worked for me was that after my first retreat, I was just so much more present in the moment and interested in what was going on in my body and mind that I, the desire to listen to music to distract myself just faded away. And I was much more interested in being on the Indian buses with the chickens and the goats and hearing all the local languages and just, you know, looking out of the window than putting Led Zeppelin in my ears. So you really don't have to condemn these things, you know. You're not a monastic, most probably, right now. And even for me, monastic life came naturally. It was kind of, I wasn't interested in those things, so it didn't feel like I had to renounce them, certainly not through force. So when you know that... There's a reason not to listen to these things. For example, the question Ajahn Brown just got about how the music can go on and on in your mind, then naturally you'll put it down. So just use the wisdom and, yeah, just observe the effect of these things on your mind. And uh, you don't need to use force or condemn any experience. All right. Excellent. So now we have the last meditation of the day. You know you're allowed to clap in Buddhism. <laughs> okay. We have the last we... meditation, followed by a blessing. Okay. It's supposed to be quiet, but what do you think? Shall um, Do you want to lead it a bit, or shall I? Or... I kind of like quiet meditation. Right. Are you okay? Will you just start dreaming of music if we don't say anything? Still quiet meditation, then we do yeah. the blessing. Okay. At 20 past? Sure. Okay. 15 minutes of quiet meditation, then 10 minutes of blessing.
you may keep your eyes closed while we give the final blessing for today. Okay, we Sabaroga, Winamuta. Sabaroga, Winamuta, Sabasanta, Pawajito, Sabaweramati. Gando ni buto tuang bawa sabi tio wewa chan tu sabo wina satu mate bawan wan tawayo suki di. Kayu go pawa piwa tanha sile sani chang wuta pachali no chatao dama watanti ayu ano sekan. For you all. So you may open your eyes now. Big sadhu? Yeah. Usually after I finish a talk like this or a day like this, people always say, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> Have you seen that before? Okay, here we go. <coughs> Loudly. Sa sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> <laughs> oh.